1 Samuel chapter number 5. We're going to just read a few verses here. A uh, very important uh, event had just occurred in Israel's history in chapter number 4. Um, they had let down their guard. They'd quit serving the Lord and worshiping God. They'd quit uh, seeking Him first. The man of God had gotten old and quit uh, uh, paying the price and putting God first. Uh, he put people in positions, his sons, who were not anointed of God. Uh, he had allowed his sons in positions that they were not qualified for. In all of this, um, there was no repentance or no seeking after God. And the Philistines came against Israel, defeated them in battle, and then uh, they took the very ark of God from Israel. The dangerous thing was when the Philistines showed up, uh, the Israelites thought, well, if we'll just take the ark of God, we'll be all right. And they went and got the ark of God, and they shouted with a great shout. The problem was there was no power behind their shout wrong with a lot of Christians and a lot of churches. Uh, they make a lot of noise. There's no power behind them. The Lord said in the last days they'd have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. And a form is just an empty shell. And there's a lot of uh, so-called Christians, so-called churches, and even some of God's people that are empty and just a shadow of what they should be for God. And so with that in mind, 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse number 1, the Bible says, And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. And when the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth, before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. And when they rose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off from the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Let's, uh, verse 5, Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for a good Sunday school hour, the lesson we learn. God, I'm thankful for that citizenship we have in that heavenly land. Lord, I'm glad we're in this world, but not of this world. I'm glad we've been bought with a price, the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm glad for the truths of thy word. And Father, we are thankful for those who are uh, watching via live stream. I know it's difficult sitting in their living rooms or sitting in their cars or uh, however they are taking it in today. Lord, it's so easy to be distracted while you're in church, let alone when you're not in church. So, Father, I pray you would bless them, you would help them, Lord, you to rest their hearts and their minds, their attention, that, God, they could hear from heaven today, find strength and sustenance for their souls, uh, increase their faith, send revival during these days. Uh, now, Lord, as uh, the Apostle Paul in our Sunday school lesson was bound, uh, Lord, we are bound today. We are bound, uh, Lord, probably by our own deserving, because we took for granted the privileges afforded us when we could come to the church freely. And now, Lord, uh, we don't have those privileges. Uh, we're only allowed to have a handful in the building. And God, uh, what a disgrace uh, and what a tragedy that has befallen your people. And Father, we're seeking for you to rise up and to, Lord, bear your mighty arms. And God, for you to 
once again restore us the privileges that we might truly have a revival in these days, that we might see a move of God, that we might appreciate you, your sanctuary, your truth, and your people uh, like never before. Uh, Father, I pray if anybody's watching and they're unsaved, uh, they get saved by the good grace of God. Uh, God, I'm interested in Christians this morning. And I pray that, Lord, this message would cause us to live up to our namesake, that we would become Christ-like, uh, that, God, we would have the touch of God and the power of God in our lives, uh, insomuch uh, that those that don't uh, would see the difference. Uh, now, Father, bless as only you can. Help us uh, bless the reading of the Word of God. Uh, Lord, certainly put a watch guard about my lips. Help me not to say anything contrary to the Word or will of God. Uh, but God, help me to say everything that you would have me to, uh, that Jesus would be magnified uh, and glorified, uh, that the devil would be horrified, uh, and that your people would truly be edified. Uh, we'll thank you and praise you for what you do, for it's in the holy and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus uh, that we ask these things. Uh, amen. Amen. I want to draw your attention to several things here uh, in this chapter. I want you to notice, first of all, the injustice. Uh, in verse number one, we find, and the Philistines took the ark of God uh, and brought it from Ebenezer uh, under Ashdod. Uh, can I say, first of all, uh, it's an injustice uh, because the Philistines had no right to the Ark of God. Uh, the Ark of God uh, was given by command to God's people from God. Uh, uh, he told them how to construct it uh, and what to do with it uh, and how to utilize it. Uh, can I say, uh, uh, there's a lot of folks in this day and age poking their nose into the business of the church. Uh, it is not their business. Uh, this is God's business. Uh, and there's been grave injustice uh, done to God's people uh, and to the house uh, and the church of the living God uh, uh, by men who have no right to do so. Uh, can I say the very ark of God uh, represented the power of God. Uh, the world knows nothing of the power of God. Uh, the world has not been translated uh, uh, from death unto life. Uh, the world has not been uh, changed from sinners unto saints. Uh, uh, the world knows nothing nothing of the new birth uh, and being made a new creature uh, uh, by Christ Jesus. Uh, uh, the world knows nothing of the power of God uh, and that is to our shame. Uh, they ought to fear the power of God. Uh, they ought to know there's a shout in God's people. Uh, they ought to know there's a changed life and a difference. Uh, uh, but the ark represented the power of God. Uh, the ark represented the presence of God. Uh, and today we're having a uh, uh, so-called worship uh, by the dictates of the world uh, because they don't know the presence of God uh, and friends uh, what a blessing to be in God's house uh, and his presence fall on his people uh, and he does for them what only God can do uh, uh, not only did it represent the power of God and the presence of God uh, but it represented the promises of God uh, and the world knows not the promises of God uh, they are foreign to them uh, but to you and I that are saved uh, what a blessing uh, I didn't know that he's a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. Uh, I didn't know that he neither slumbers nor sleeps. Uh, I didn't know. Uh, hallelujah. What a blessing to know that his love goes much farther than our deepest sin. Uh, what a blessing to know the promises of God. Uh, we see the injustice. The Philistines uh, have robbed the people of God of the ark of God. Uh, notice, if you will, the insult. Look in verse number 2. The Bible says, When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Uh, here the house of God uh, has been robbed of the ark of God. Uh, and now they've taken the ark of God. Uh, and not only was that an injustice, but it becomes an insult uh, when they put it in the house of their pagan god uh, and set it uh, before their pagan god. What an insult! Uh, to Almighty God, uh, uh, that man is dictating to God's people uh, how God are to worship today. Uh, that's an insult to God. Uh, that's an insult to God's people. Uh, it's an insult when man tells us uh, we're non-essential. Uh, au contraire, uh, the Bible said we are 
royal priesthood, a chosen generation. We are not of the rudiments of this world. Hey, they may say we're deplorable. They may say that we're despicable. They may say we're non-essential. But you hang on, neighbor. There's coming a day before the throne of God will be recognized as that bride of Christ. And all the world will see how essential we were to this world. It's an insult that they put the ark of God in the house of Dagon. It's an insult to God's people that the world identifies us as non-important. Notice the injustice, the insult. But we've alluded to it. Look at the idol in verse 3. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him up in his place again. We see the idol. Dagon was the Philistine god that they worshipped. He was a god made by hands of man. And they propped him up and they paid homage to him and they sacrificed to him uh, and they prayed to him uh, and they promoted him uh, and they pulled him out and took him around everywhere they went. Uh, this is our God. Uh, I'm hallelujah thankful. Uh, uh, we don't take God where we go. He goes before us. Uh, and I'm glad. Hallelujah. He's not an image that you bow to. Uh, he's not man-made. Uh, I'm glad our God is God. Hallelujah. We see the idol. But notice the invincible. Look in verse number 4. They wake up in verse 3 and they find their gods fallen over before the ark. Where in verse number 4 they find a little bit more of that, but with a big exclamation point on it. And when they rose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off from a, a, a cut off upon the threshold. We find that in verse number four, God proves he's invincible. Now God has been insulted. God's people have faced injustice. And uh, uh, both are propped up before something that uh, 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 their captors have said uh, is the authority. But we find in verse number four, their authority is not the final authority. We find the invincible one. God proves some things in verse number four. He proves uh, he's almighty. He's omnipotent. He's all power. Can I say he's represented in that ark. God don't even have to get out of the ark. God just thought it and there God fell not once but twice before the ark can I say he proves not only is he all powerful he's all sufficient God didn't need anybody to do that for him hmm? can I say this uh, he proves he's the only authority they find Dagon the second time with his head broke off and with his hands broke off now that is very significant. God was sending a message to the Philistines. The head represents knowledge and wisdom uh, and authority. That's been cut off. The hands represent power. That's been cut off. God shows uh, that he is the only authority by cutting off the hand and head of the thing that the, the Philistines thought most of. And so with that in mind, I want to preach on this thought for a little bit. I want to preach on when God, when God cuts off his opposition. When God cuts off his opposition. Now, I don't have time to go throughout the Bible, but let me just say this. There's never been a time, there, there's never been a people, there's never been a tyrant, there's never been a dictator who stood in opposition to God that ever won. Mm -mm. And can I say, first of all, we find in this instance, he cut off paganism. Mm. We find in verse number four that he cut off his head and his hands. 
He is the God of the Philistines, who at that time was the mightiest of the mightiest uh, on the face of the earth. Uh, when it came to their physical might, uh, when it came to their armies, uh, 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 all other nations feared the Philistines. Uh, and they took their God Dagon before them. Uh, 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 the Israelites were not skilled in battle nor skilled in war, uh, but God went before them and delivered all the heathen nations before them uh, 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 to them. Uh, and we find... Uh, 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 they did it with the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, so when the Philistines had an opportunity to seize that, uh, they thought they were the greatest. Uh, but can I say, uh, uh, God showed them uh, He didn't need Israel's help. Uh, he didn't need an army. Uh, uh, God defeated their God instantly overnight. Uh, uh, and He defeated and He cut off uh, uh, paganism. What He did is He removed the deity of the Philistines. Uh, uh, can I say, uh, uh, today in America there's a lot of people worshiping a lot of things. Uh, uh, there's Buddha worshipers. Uh, uh, hey, uh, there's uh, uh, Jehovah's Witness worshipers. Uh, there are Mormon worshipers. Uh, uh, there are all the cults here. Uh, you got the Christian scientists and the Christian crazies. Uh, you got charismatics. Uh, and you got all kinds of people taking away the deity of God. Uh, uh, can I say, uh, in America today, uh, we've got little tyrants running around. Uh, uh, saying that God's people can't worship uh, and they think they're the deity. Uh, they think they're the authority. Uh, but I've got good news to you. Uh, God doesn't share His glory with nobody. Uh, and in due season, uh, God's people, uh, they'll uh, uh, reap uh, if they don't faint. Uh, and there's coming a day uh, when God's cutting off all the heads of all the pagans that folks worship uh, and all other deities before Him. Uh, God himself will prove who he is. He cut off paganism. He removed all deity from the Pharisees. Uh, uh, can I say this? He removed all doubt from the Pharisees. They knew who God was. Matter of fact, we read on. They don't want the ark anymore. They take it back to Israel. Uh, why? It removed all doubt. They knew uh, the power uh, uh, behind God. Uh, and can I say this? It removed all dignity from the Pharisees. Uh, look again at verse number 5. Uh, it says, Therefore neither the priest of Dagon uh, nor any that come into Dagon's house uh, tread the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod unto this day. Uh, hey, listen, they didn't even go back to that temple anymore because they knew there was no dignity there. God cut off paganism. Can I say this? If you study the Bible, God cut off Pharaoh. Pharaoh ruled the world. He had Israel in bondage for 400 years. Now I understand we've only been in bondage about 40 days. It seems like 400 years. Can I say? Pharaoh, uh, he thought he was it. God sent Moses down there and told him to let God's people go. And what it did is it hardened Pharaoh's heart. And his heart became harder and harder and harder. When God broke him, he broke him. Uh, he cut him off. There was no more Pharaoh. Uh, I say, what happened? Uh, can I say God used plagues uh, uh, to cut off Pharaoh? Uh, uh, can I say every plague uh, that God sent, uh, uh, it was for the purpose of hardening uh, Pharaoh's heart uh, uh, so there would be no doubt when God broke him uh, that God broke him. Uh, but can I say this? Uh, every plague that was sent uh, there in Exodus, uh, all ten plagues uh, were sent uh, uh, to attack and defeat one of the gods of Egypt. Uh, Egypt worshipped everything. Uh, they worshipped the creature, not the creator. Uh, and they had gods for everything. Uh, and every plague God sent uh, was in direct uh, opposition and defilement against Egypt's gods. Uh, and they would pray to their gods. Uh, and their gods could not overcome the plague. Uh, but the God of glory sent a plague that overcame their gods. Uh, listen, God sent uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the plague uh, that turned the river into blood for seven days and seven nights. Uh, Egypt had a god named Hapai. Uh, that was the Nile River God. Uh, and God showed that his plague was greater than their river God. Uh, 
Hey, God sent a plague of frogs, uh, and they had a god named Hect, uh, who was a frog goddess, uh, and the frog goddess couldn't keep the frogs away. Uh, hey, uh, God sent uh, uh, two different plagues against one of their gods, a plague of lice uh, and a plague of flies, uh, and that attacked their god Seb, uh, and Seb was the earth god. Uh, he was the protector of things that came out of the ground. Uh, he couldn't protect them because uh, Almighty God's in control. Uh, God sent, uh, uh, my dear friends, a plague that destroyed all the cattle in Egypt. Uh, and that was a direct plague uh, uh, to affect their God, Hathor. Uh, that was their big God. Uh, if you've ever seen any movies about ancient Egypt, uh, you'll always find a God, uh, a goddess uh, with the head of a cow. Uh, that was her. Uh, she was just old heifer. Uh, and God killed all the cattle in Egypt. Uh, hey, God sent uh, uh, the plague of boils on man and beast in Egypt. Uh, that was against their God, Imhotep, uh, which was the God of medicine. Uh, God sent two plagues from the sky. Uh, one of them was locusts, uh, and one of them was hail of fire. Uh, and that was against their God, goddess Nut, uh, the goddess of the sky. Uh, and your nut, uh, if you worship to anything in the sky uh, and don't worship Jesus Christ, uh, God sent the, uh, the, the plague of darkness for three days and three nights. Uh, that was against Horus, the sun god. Uh, and God showed the sun is no god. Uh, by the way, you go to Hobby Lobby, you go to Michael's, you go to any place you can get uh, decorations for your house, uh, you'll find suns. Uh, People got sons hanging around the house. Uh, they got sons in their garden. Uh, they got these little uh, ceramic and metal uh, 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 sons all decorated. They think, oh, isn't that cute? Uh, you go to any Catholic church, you look around uh, amongst all their idols. Uh, you'll find a son in there somewhere. Uh, uh, all that paganism uh, is about worshiping the sun. Uh, hey, you go to the beach, you'll find sun worshipers. Uh, I want to tell you something. Uh, I don't worship the S-U-N. Uh, I worship the S-U-N. In. Uh, his name is Jesus uh, and he proved to Pharaoh their son God uh, uh, had no power uh, and then the final plague God sent upon Egypt uh, was the plague of the firstborn uh, being destroyed uh, on that night where we got to Passover uh, when God saw the blood over the door uh, he passed over them uh, uh, but listen that was a plague uh, against Emunui uh, uh, the God of the firstborn uh, God sent plagues uh, to defeat Pharaoh, uh, cut him off. Uh, can I say God cuts off his opposition? He cut off paganism. He cut off Pharaoh. He used plagues, but not only that, he used a pillar. In Ezekiel or uh, in Exodus chapter fourteen, verse twenty-four, the Bible says, uh, "And it came to pass that in the morning, watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire uh, and of the cloud that troubled the host of the Egyptians." Uh, you know the story. Uh, Pharaoh let God's people go uh, after those ten plagues, uh, and they left. Uh, they not only left Egypt, they left with all the spoils of Egypt. Uh, they took everything they wanted out of Egypt. Pharaoh wanted them away. Uh, he said their God's too great. Uh, he just uh, destroyed all of our gods. Uh, and they left, and they left with all the spoils of Egypt. Uh, they got down there to about to the Red Sea. Uh, and they, uh, uh, Pharaoh pursued after them. Uh, and he pursued after them with all the armies of Egypt. Uh, and all of that coming upon uh, uh, the children of Israel. Uh, and many of them began to murmur against the man of God. Uh, can I say, uh, complaining about the preachers, nothing new. Uh, and uh, Moses. Uh, 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 as he's brought up to the Red Sea uh, uh, and the people are complaining and said wouldn't to God we'd have died in Egypt uh, then to come out here and die uh, Moses uh, 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 before he was ever filled with the Holy Ghost the Holy Ghost welled up inside of him uh, and he said stand still and see the salvation of the Lord uh, and you know God parted the Red Sea uh, and God's people walked across on dry ground uh, but what kept Pharaoh from getting to him God sent a pillar of fire that stayed them. They couldn't get to God's people because there was a pillar between them and God's people. 
Can I say, hallelujah, we need some pillars in our day. And if nothing else is from my Aunt Lynn, who's watching her favorite message of all time, our pillars we need in the church. Uh, hallelujah, we need pillar preachers. Uh, who will still preach the word of God. Uh, who will still proclaim uh, uh, the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, we need pillars of prayer. Uh, grabbing the horns of the altar. Uh, calling on God and getting God on the scene. Uh, we need pillars of praise. Uh, who aren't afraid to stand up in the uh, grocery stores. Uh, or at the Walmart or at the Home Depot or on the job and certainly in the church house and said praise be unto God I once was lost but now I'm found hey we need pillars that will plant the seed of the word of God and witness and testify to folks about the gospel we need pillars that will prop up a brother or sister who's been overtaken in a fault who's under a struggle who's worried about something uh, who's just facing some opposition uh, somebody to go be a friend uh, and prop them up uh, hey we need pillar parents uh, that'll teach their children not only right or wrong uh, but teach them about the importance of church uh, the importance of the gospel uh, the importance of Jesus in their life uh, and we need pillars with power uh, that have the touch of God on their lives uh, that are a form of godliness uh, but they're the ones that others look to and say that that's what I want to be like. God defeated Pharaoh with plagues with a pillar. But can I say, he cut him off, destroyed him for good in his divine providence when he drowned him in that Red Sea. You see, Peter, uh, uh, Pharaoh, in all of his zeal and all of his bitterness and all of his anger and all that he had within him seeking to destroy God's people, God, the very thing he used to deliver God's people is the thing he used to destroy Pharaoh and his entire army. God cut off Pharaoh. Can I say? A lot of people are against the church. A lot of people are using this occasion right now to hinder churches. It, it boggles my mind that they're letting criminals out of jail, but they're wanting to arrest God's people and put them in jail for doing what we are supposed to do and what we have a constitutional right to do. Worship God. And can I say, it's not only they're abusing their authority against the church and God's people. I'm seeing reports where they're arresting people in parks and they're arresting people uh, that are out in public facilities where nobody else is and they're, they're trying to uh, uh, flex their muscles and show that they're something when they are nothing. God knows how to cut them off, friend. Can I say he cut off paganism? He cut off Pharaoh. Can I say God cut off the Pharisee? I don't have time to turn there, but if you look over in 1 Samuel 17, you'll find there's a big, ugly Pharisee. He's about 9 foot 3 inches tall. His name is Goliath. And for 40 days, he cussed God. He cussed the people of God. He cussed everything about God. And he called for him to give him a man. Give me a man! If you defeat me, we'll serve you. If I defeat you, you'll serve us. Forty days. All of Israel cowered down. You know, what amazes me in all of this thing is how many people have cowered down. They're afraid to say anything. Well, as Christians, we well, are not supposed to say anything about anybody. Well, as Jordan brought out in Sunday school, Paul just spoke up and said he was a, a Roman citizen. He'd been beat to death or close to it. When we don't stand up and proclaim whose we are and the rights we have in whom we believe in, my dear friends, the church gets stamped out. Well, they, they was, they was uh, absolutely uh, in fear of this big old giant. It amazes me how many people that claim they know God's been afraid of this virus. And it amazes me how many people say they're afraid that they know God, but they're afraid of the governor. And they know God, and they're afraid of this, and they're afraid of that. And they're afraid. Well, the Bible says perfect love casts out all fear. Right. You may know God, but you're not in love with God. When you get in love with God and you get close to God, there's nothing in this world going to bother you because you know who you are and who you believed in. But this Pharisee comes against God's people. Call him for a man. Well, God cut him off. How did God cut him off? First of all, he used a shepherd boy. Huh? He used a shepherd to go out there. Now, he's wanting a man of war. Matter of fact, he said, here, I call for a man. You send me 
You send me this lad. He said, what, are you mocking me? Then he looks at, at the shepherd, David. He says, I'm going to cut your head off. I'm going to feed you to the dogs. I mean, he, he's cussing David. Hmm? Uh, David said, you come to me with spirit and sword. I come to you in the name of the Lord. Huh? Send a shepherd. You know what we need? We need some shepherds today. Thank God there's some men of God who are still preaching, who are still standing true, who are still fighting the opposition. But there's a lot of them aren't worth the powder to take the blow away. God used a shepherd. It's a picture of the man of God. He's not the most noble, the mightiest, the biggest, the bravest. He's just an instrument in God's hand. Then God used a sling. Uh, king of Israel, Saul wanted David to use his armor. He said, I hadn't proved that. He said, but what I have proved, I'm going to use. Used a sling. Sling is a picture of the Holy Ghost. Hmm. I don't need all the tactics of the world. I just need him. Hey. Then he used a stone. Huh? That's a picture of the Rock of Ages. Our heavenly stone. Our Ebenezer, Jesus Christ. If Jesus don't get it done, it ain't going to get done. huh? And then he used the Word of God, a sword. See, because after David hit him with the stone, he fell on his face forward. I've used that analogy before. You get hit in the forehead, you're not going to fall forward. You're going to fall backward. Why did he fall forward? Because the Holy Ghost hit him from behind. Fell forward, and then David used Goliath's own sword and cut his head off. And can I say, God cut off the opposition, cut off the Pharisee. He used the sword, the perfect word of God. There is no argument for the, against the word of God. It's truth. Sometimes the truth hurts. That's why they're trying to shut us down so they don't have to deal with the truth. They wanted to put people in fear. You know what would have happened if churches would have been open and people would have been able to come to church they'd have heard about this great God who could overcome their fears. But they wanted to keep people in fear. They wanted to put people in bondage. They wanted to put, press people down under their thumb. That's why they're not opening. God bless the governor of Georgia. We're opening up everything. Well, I'd like to get a haircut. So would my dog. huh? There's so many things that we've been robbed of because of fear. Hmm? People laid off. People can't pay their mortgage. People can't put food on their table. And, and people tell them they're non-essential. Uh, their mortgage company don't think they're not essential. Mm -mm. God cut off the Pharisee, cut off Pharaoh, cut off paganism, can I say? God cut off the plight of mankind. The Bible says in Psalms 55, 4, My heart is sore pained within me. The terrors of death are fallen upon me. The king of terrors is death. It's the reason man wears wristwatch, why we keep time sheets, why everything's on a schedule, for it is pointed unto man wants to die, and after this the judgment. The very conscience of man knows he's had an appointment he's going to keep. It's called death. Why do you think every year billions of dollars are spent on uh, uh, cosmetics and physical fitness equipment and gyms? And people are trying to stay young because they don't want to face death. It's the king of terrors. But aren't you glad that God cut off death? Oh, he did. You see, through the finished works of Calvary, Jesus came and he destroyed the king of terrors. Huh? He took our death on Calvary, was buried, and rose again according to the scriptures to overcome the very thing that we have to face that would have destroyed us. Can I say he overcame death? Old death, where's thy victory? Hmm? Where's that sting at? The sting of death is gone. Hmm? Christians don't die. They just fall asleep, wake up in, in glory. That great terror of death no longer terrifies Christians that are ready to go home. He defeated. He destroyed our death. He took our damnation, destroyed it. He went to the lower parts of the earth. He overcame death. He overcame hell. I'm not going to hell. Why? Because the blood of Jesus cleansed me from all sin. He not only defeated death for me, he took my damnation and destroyed it. But then he also cut off my doom, the grave. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. You see, outside of him resurrecting, there would be no hope. We'd be hopeless. We'd have no uh, 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 anything to look forward to. 
we'd live our lives and die like a dog. But you see, man has a soul. And Jesus Christ destroyed the plight of man, death, hell, and the grave. And he came to give us life and life more abundantly. Oh, they may shut down our services, but you know what they can't shut down? The spout where the glory comes out. They can't shut him down. They can't take what's inside because that's him and he's done paid for it. My soul's been sealed by the Holy Ghost of God. You see, the Lord cuts off his opposition. I don't have time to get into Haman. I don't have time to get into uh, all the others that face great opposition and how God defeated what came against them. But let me close with this. One of these days, God's going to cut off the prince of this world. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, verse 2, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. There is a devil, friends. His name is Satan. He is the accuser. He is a destroyer, Apollyon. He seeks to destroy men's souls in hell forever. He wants to bring harm to you. He wants to oppress you. He puts that spirit of disobedience in the minds of people to harm God's people. Because if He can keep us down, if He can keep us quiet, if He can destroy our testimonies, then the world won't hear about how great Jesus is and that Jesus can deliver their never-dying soul. He's the prince and the power of the air, the Bible says. In John 12, 31, Jesus says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. He's the prince of this world. But one day Jesus is going to destroy him. The Bible says in Revelation 20, 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. The devil knows his future. And he knows his time is short. He's pulling out all the stops. Because in his wicked, deceitful mind, he's deceived himself to think that maybe, just maybe, he will win in the end. But we know, and deep down he knows, his end is the lake of fire. And our end is heavenly bliss with the Lord, the Lamb of God. God's always cut off his opposition. Now, friend, this light affliction that we're facing, because not, we're not being strung out and beaten for our faith. We're not being imprisoned for our faith, oh, they try. We're not being harshly done wrong for our faith. All their people want to turn us in and talk bad about us. And the media will say we're trying to kill people. Here's the bottom line. If people get coronavirus, they can't prove where they got it from. They're putting plastic bags over the credit card machines at Kroger. But somebody's touched that bag before you. This virus comes through contact. You get your mail every day. Somebody touched your mail. Many people touched your mail. It can live for up to three days on any surface. You could have got it at Kroger's. You could have got it at Home Depot. You could have got it at the mail. You could sit at home and never leave your house and still get it by touching things that somebody else has touched. So coming to the house of God is no grave, more grave danger than going to Kroger's or anywhere else. Bottom line is if you get it, it's because God allowed you to get it. But they want to use all kinds of fear tactics to oppose the Word of God and the things of God. Oh, they'll say they're believers. They'll say that we still have the ability to worship through live stream. This is not worship. I said it the other night. If God wanted to, uh, uh, the, Him to be worshipped through the dictates of the airways, He'd write His Word in the sky. Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. And those that now have the facts and still seek to bring opposition against God's people and against the Word of God and against the house of God, God help them because they're playing with fire. And it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And friend, I don't have to defend us. God does a great job of it. 
Now I say all that to say this. There are a lot of things opposing you today. The very battle, you've heard me preach this for years, the very battle is in your mind. You can be cooped up in your house and there's a battle raging in your mind. That sorry, no good devil put thoughts in your mind. He'll put thoughts on shows you watch that put thoughts in your mind. He'll use any means necessary to destroy your faith. God's going to cut him off someday. And everybody that stands in opposition to what God wants to do today is going to face God in this life or the life to come. And it's not going to be good for them. So what should you and I do? Just keep looking up. Just keep being what we need to be. Throughout the Bible, God's people, when they were what they were supposed to be, God showed up quickly and avenged them. I don't want him to show up and punish me. I want him to show up and defend me. My dear friend, he is our advocate. He is our mediator. He is our victor. And we just need to rely on him. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him despised the shame, endured the cross, that you and I might be saved. Just keep looking to him. Keep trusting in him. He'll take care of all the rest of this stuff. He always has, and he always will. I'll just hang out with Jesus. I'll just draw nigh to Jesus. I'll just dwell in the privileges afforded me in being a citizen of that heavenly land. I'll just trust in Jesus. And if you're watching today, Governor, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes for all the money in the world. Because what you've stood for in aborting babies and killing babies, what you've stood for with the liquor crowd and the gambling crowd, what you've stood for in opposition to the Word of God and now opposing the church of God, you're headed for a destiny with God. And it doesn't look good for you. Mr. Governor, I urge you and any unbeliever watching to repent and put your faith in the Lord and do what the Lord tells you to do and avoid the judgment that's coming your way. It's God's will that none should perish, but that all should repent. Why don't you come and trust the Lord, Mr. Governor, Mr. Center. Put your faith in the Lord. Because what you don't know is every day you breathe God's air, you're in opposition to God, you're at enmity with God, you're the enemy of God when you're lost in your sins. Your sins what caused his son to die on Calvary. And God is angry with the wicked every day. God has given you a space of grace to look his way, repent, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. I'd do that today. Put your faith in the Lord. If you're saved... Just keep looking up. Neighbor, this thing's almost over. And what a day it's going to be when we get to see Jesus face to face. Oh, happy day, neighbor. And it's a happy day here if you know Jesus. Because we know, hey, this is as close to hell as we're ever going to get. And I say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. I'm glad that, Lord, you not only defeated Dagon, you defeated everything. You've never even been challenged, Lord. You are omnipotent. You are omniscient. You are omnipresent. You are the King of glory. And Lord, we bless your holy name. Now Lord, what we're facing, Paul even said, it's a light affliction. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. There's coming a day, Lord, when this won't even be a memory. But Lord, while we're going through this, help us to trust in you. Help us to keep looking unto you. And God, we implore you to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. God, get glory even through this mess. And God, save sinners during these days. God, I pray you'd save our governor. And I pray he'd start doing right. I pray for every politician that didn't save. You'd save them. And they'd start legislating righteously. And our country, once again, would become what she was intended to be. God, I pray you'd be glorified in it all. And I pray that everyone would look to thee and say, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Bless now throughout this day. Bless those that have been watching. Help your people. We'll thank you for it. For it's in the holy name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for tuning in. We'll never be of help to you. Give us a call. 
Keep looking up. Jesus is coming soon. God bless you. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.